Hello, and welcome to another edition of Razor Wire with your host, James Reese, myself. Now, today, we are going to be revisiting the wonderful world of cyber insurance, where we're going to be discussing the current situation with cyber insurance, what the current trends are, what do we think about it, and I have some fantastic guests to help me along on this journey, um, and we will introduce them right now. And to talk about the revisit to cyber insurance for Razor Wire, who could I not have back but Matthew Clark? And today we're joined by another professional in this side of things, the more on the more incident response side of uh, cyber insurance, Neil Hare Brown, an old friend of mine from way, way back. Neil, do you want to introduce yourself first since you're, uh, you're the newbie and then we'll move on to Matt? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me today. Um, as I say, James, we've known each other for a long time. I've been in cyber this year for 40 years. Um, originally with um, law enforcement, um, looking at computer crime, the first computer crime unit in the back of Holborn Police Station, um, and assisting in those sort of early investigations, pre-internet, I should say, some of them. Um, and then... Um, Moving into uh, CISO roles, or they weren't called CISO in those days, the CISO roles for a few banks. Then I set up sort of the first computer forensics company in the mid nineties in the in the UK, um, and sort of grew that. And then moved into cyber insurance side of things. Uh, over my career, I've sort of had the pleasure of, sort of looking at risk quite deeply, um, working with. Um, people such as Jack Jones on uh, FAIR, uh, other risk modelling um, methodologies such as Octave um, and our own methodology that we made up as well, or made up, formulated. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, and, but in terms of cyber insurance, been in that area now for 12 years, um, set up, I think, one of the first, if not the first, uh, incident response service for insurers um, in 2012 and sort of grew that and now sort of dealing with over 100 claims each year, um, ranging from visiting our compromise to ransom, ransomware and everything else, really. Um, and yeah, so I've been, been operating in cyber insurance and learning a lot from those guys and seeing exactly how cyber insurance can really benefit organizations across the board. Fantastic. Welcome. And returning, we have Matthew. Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? It's been a while. It has. Thank, thanks for having me back on, James. Um, delighted to be to be uh, back on. Um, yes, I'm Matthew Clark. I'm I've been in insurance for almost 40 years now. Um, uh, various different roles, but but chiefly risk advisory type positions, working for insurance brokers uh, in different parts of the world, uh, and um, a very broad array of different types of industries sectors that that have been served. Um, particularly, I think um, a passion for any kind of scientific and technological um, uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, businesses of all of all sizes, from startups um, right the way through to multinationals. And I'm currently working for Partners and Group as the cyber director, uh, and we're essentially helping to um, get our clients on a journey of understanding um, around cyber risk and what it can do to their businesses, regardless of what size or sector they're in. Um, so a lot of what I do now is is um, engagement focused work, trying to get conversations started or help colleagues to get conversations started with their clients around cyber risk. Um, not necessarily with a view to flogging an insurance policy at the end of the day, I have to say. What we do is we focus on client resilience. So much of what we're focused on is helping clients to understand what cyber is, um, particularly SMEs, where, where there's often a lack of understanding there, um, and using <clears throat> tools and materials that we've developed ourselves or third-party tools and materials that we've brought in to, to help sort of put colour on the subject 
um, and, and then to help assess what the, those clients need to do about getting themselves into a more um, uh, a more resilient position using you know common sense practical steps to improve their cybersecurity. Um, in doing so, that happens to make them more insurable. And cyber insurance is something that's been available now for over 20 years in one form or another. Um, and has, in, in more recent times, have coalesced around a specific, um, almost standardized type of coverage, although there are still variances between different insurance products. Um, and it, it, we, we're on a, a journey, as I say, to, to sort of making um, clients aware of the benefits that insurance can bring um, uh, in, in the in the sphere of cyber risk. So basically, yeah, we've we're revisiting um, cyber insurance, um, and when we talked about it last, it was very much a case that um, I think the industry was was still quite new to kind of the whole insurance side of things, and maybe a lot of CISOs, a lot of infosec people didn't quite understand what. Um, <clears throat> cyber insurance was what it really covered when they could kind of claim on it and i know there was a, a, a one specifically large case that was going to court where you know there was potentially a lot of a, a large payout that needed to happen to a particularly large organization who'd experienced um one of the early day kind of like uh, ransomware attacks i think it was uh, without going back through the notes where kind of are we now with cyber insurance within the security industry is there a lot more awareness now or you know are we still kind of in the space where we were a couple of years ago i mean obviously attacks have gotten bigger they've gotten more prolific where kind of are we with it i'm happy to to share some some stats which you know have crop, cropped up in my world over the last few years particularly since since covid hit and uh, there, there are, I think there's no definitive go-to statistic for, for, the, for the amount of cyber insurance currently sold. Um, but the, the estimates tend to range between, I know Aviva recently published some stats where they felt that um, uh, the penetration rates were around 10%. I think CFC and a few others, uh, these are insurance companies, um, uh, reckon that it's probably at best around 15%. So if we consider that between 10 and 15% of UK businesses buy cyber insurance, we still have a lot of work to do, right, in terms of addressing that underinsurance that currently exists, particularly with SMEs, particularly with small to medium-sized businesses who we know are the ones that are attacked. So um, I think it's improving. We've certainly seen in our own um, a panel of, of accounts, and we have around forty to fifty thousand clients. So it's a decent um, representative group, if you like. You know, we've certainly seen the penetration rates increasing gradually there, not as fast as I would like, um, but um, I think the awareness factor is slowly starting to to bite. Um, I think that the the hike in attacks that happened um, as a result of of COVID and people suddenly having to pivot their operations outside of their customary firewalls and so on has driven a lot of activity in this area. People are now realizing they have to think about this space. And then brokers such as myself are having conversations with their clients more regularly about the existence of cyber insurance and how it might bring benefits to them. So there's a lot more work still to do, but it's certainly on the up, up. It's certainly on the increase. And Neil, you're in this space from our perspective. So what, are you seeing something similar? Is it, I mean, what are you, what are you seeing from your angle? It's definitely, as you're saying, I'm just definitely was sort of, um, I would say there's been a slow uptake and there was certainly lots of fear, uncertainty and doubt that was being spread in the sort of cyber, cyber, cyber risk management circles. Sort of, uh, and a lot of it was just, just not, the, not true, essentially, um, about, you know, the downsides of cyber insurance. And, you know, so, you know, I remember attending a couple of rants and um, people were sort of, putting in their sort of 10 pence worth about the downsides of cyber insurance. And if they were, if they were working in the cyber insurance fields, like I think, you know, we're lucky, my company at Storm Guidance, we're in a way quite lucky that we've been on a lot of the journey of cyber insurance prior to, I would say 2010, you know, while cyber insurance had and cyber liability insurance, as it was called then was sort of, you know, it was possible to 
to buy, et cetera. It was a very specialist um, product. And it's really only since about 2012 that it's gradually become more and more popular. And really, I'd say in 2017 till now has been the sort of the, the real, you know, much more growth. Um, there's still a long way to go in the UK, as Matthew was saying. I think that, yeah, the penetration might be somewhere between 10 and 15%. And so you compare that with the US where it's sort of like towards 40%. There's still a long way to go. And um, it's really regulations in the US that have driven um, the growth of cyber insurance in the US. And I'm hoping that one day the, the Information Commissioner will grow a pair in the UK and um, start to... Um, enforce the law a little bit and make people respect it. And um, maybe we'll start to get the same sort of similar focus for businesses um, as to, you know, what they'd be looking at when they have an incident in terms of their regulatory obligations. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think there is there is a, a growth going on at the moment. I hope it's going to in, increase a little bit. Most companies do not appreciate the sort of impact that cyber incidents are going to have on their balance sheet, the work that Matthew and his colleagues and lots of other people in the field are doing to try and uh, enlighten them as to what those impacts are going to be should definitely drive them into thinking that cyber insurance is pretty much the only option to, to, to deal with some of these costs. I mean, we see a lot of figures bandying around for the average cost of cyber incidents and all the rest of it. And Neil, whilst we have you here, obviously... I mean, you know, are, are those kind of figures that we're seeing realistic or do you have sets of figures yourself that you're seeing? And then obviously we'll, we'll go to Matt, who who no doubt will give you kind of like a view from their angle, what they're seeing. What are you seeing from your side of things? I mean, obviously you've got the ransomware element, um, you, as you mentioned, the... Uh, the legal element, which is still yet to catch up. Um, but then you've also got the clear up operation as well that comes with that. I mean, what are you seeing? Risk is, risk is two factors, right? The, 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 the probable frequency and probable impact. And I think the, the probable frequency as most people in the profession, hopefully all with a test has been growing over the last sort of five, 10 years, definitely the last five years, the frequency of various specific types of attack, really it's ransomware and business email compromise that have driven the frequencies up. And at the moment, I think there is a little bit of a lull. It definitely has come in waves for us dealing with claims. Um, and there's a slight, I wouldn't say tail off is the wrong term, but there's a slight sort of pause at the moment, most of that is because the Russia-Ukraine war has been going on for a couple of years and people who had had left the country to avoid the draft uh, on two-year visas have now had to come back and they are getting caught in the new draft in both countries. And uh, so that is putting a little bit of a kibosh on their operations, especially on the ransomware side. But anyway, nonetheless, it's still, it's still quite prevalent. On the other factor, on the, the probable... Uh, impact or probable loss, that is uh, a cost that has gone up and up and up. Um, and certainly uh, the, the way that threat actors now have modified their attacks to extort businesses, not only for um, the, the impact on availability of data, because for instance, with ransomware, that data has been encrypted and needs to be decrypted pot potentially if, if businesses don't have backups. Then, but th th there's the other side of it now, which is the reputational harm that that comes from a, a data breach. So that sort of uh, double extortion is now very much the flavour of the month or flavour of the year, and the uh, and bit that's also extending now into business email compromise, where the attackers are saying, "Well, we you know we've we've hijacked this mailbox or that mailbox, uh, and now um, that's given us access to n gigabytes of." Uh, in some cases, quite sensitive messages plus their attachments. And so how about, um, you know, you pay us not to release that data um, publicly. So extortion is starting to rear its ugly head in, in business email compromise as well. A bit like that Sony hack as well, because we saw a lot of that with the Sony hack, didn't we? Yeah, and I think um, the the threat actors, it's, it's quite strange that 
I'm sure um, anyone who sort of like deals with with incidents on a regular basis would sort of attest to the fact that the business email compromise threat actors are, you know, a different bunch from the ransomware as a service um, threat actors. And um, they've got, you know, they've been driven by different um, modus operandi. They've had different aims. There's many more uh, business email compromise threat actors than there are ransomware as a service. If you go right to the sort of the, you know, the apex cyber criminals, uh, there aren't many of those if you're looking at ransomware gangs. Um, obviously, they've got thousands of affiliates, but if you look at the actual the drivers, the apex criminals, um, whereas with business email compromise, it's, it's much more widespread and it's, it, the, the threat actors are in many more different countries um, and their sort of fraudulent deception, deception techniques are also very multi-language you know, so um, there are those, you know, we're seeing things develop in different ways. Yeah, I, I think this is an area where um, the the available, the only good thing about cyber attacks when they happen and when they're insured is that it gives us data, right? So so since since COVID's hit, or even before then, uh, the, just the mass of, of insured cyber events have given us useful information that we can we can we can uh, interrogate and look for trends in and it's enabled us to to be able to provide some some quite startling insights to to clients and prospects so in with with tools like cfc's ransomware calculator um or uh, coalition another a us cyber insurer they have a similar tool available on their their website which i believe is free to to use uh, you can actually put in a little bit of information about your business and the size of the business, its revenue, its staff count, uh, and uh, you'll get an indication based upon empirical claims data from claims, cyber claims against made by by businesses in your side of your side of your sector. It'll tell you what they cost the insurers to pay. So, it's they're really useful insights, compelling insights to, for, for businesses now to be able to to, to put a, a value on what a cyber attack could cost them, different types of cyber attack. Neil's absolutely right. You know, it's it's all about ransomware attacks. It's all about um, funds transfer frauds, which is the kind of downstream consequence of business email com- compromise very often. And those are the two, the two uh, major types of cyber attack that we see uh, resulting in claims. Um, as long as it's easy and lucrative for the bad guys to do this, they will continue to do it. Uh, there's ransomware as a service uh, routes into to that market now that they can use to make it super easy. The ransomware gangs can, can crime gangs can make it super easy to pull these things off. Um, we 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 see um, the government now taking an interest. Of course, the UK government has its annual cybersecurity survey that it puts stats out on each year. The last one I saw was for 2023. I think the next one comes out in, in April, May time, if I'm not mistaken. But last year, the, the report showed that 32% of businesses were reporting at least one cyber attack attack against them in the past 12 months. So right away, you can see that the frequency is around one in three, okay, um, which is a useful thing to be able to say to clients who are considering uh, this area and maybe cyber insurance, well, there's a one in three chance you're going you're gonna to become a victim. Um, and here's some free um, empirical data that shows us what it's going to cost when it does happen. So those two things collectively are now a really powerful way of putting some color on this issue, for, particularly for smaller businesses, helping them understand, therefore, what the benefits of an insurance policy would be and how valuable the, the premium is in relation to their exposure, right? Because that's ultimately what they're going to be considering. Is, is, my, is my risk here sufficient for me to fork out for the premium? Okay. So, I mean, speaking on premiums at the moment, I mean, what are you know, what are we looking at nowadays when it comes to uh, cyber insurance and and getting it? How is that premium set these days? Well, I, I mean, insurers, I can um, probably start with this one. Insurers have gotten better and better at using this data that they now have to assess frequency and severity. <clears throat> Which, uh, as Neil was saying earlier, you know, uh, if you can understand how often something's going to happen and what the impact's going to be financially, you've got the basics for for modelling some insurance pricing. And 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 the more the more that these 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 attacks happen, the more data that we have around that. Of course, insurers have other tricks up their sleeve. They can use things like honeypot trend analysis information to see how the bad guys are op- operating. They can relate that to the kind of um, 
domain scan uh, data that they have on their on their clients to see where there may be vulnerabilities. They can be proactive about getting policyholders to uh, r repair or, or improve cybersecurity during the policy period, actually, oftentimes, so that there's less chance of, of, uh, of, a, of a claim having to be paid. Um, all of that has a downward pressure on the premium. But let, just, just jumping back the last couple of years, we saw a spike in claims following COVID. We saw the insurance market contracting a little bit after that, as they always do in that sort of cyclical cycle. We saw insurance premium rates climbing. We saw greater demands on cybersecurity. We want you to prove yourself to be more insurable before we insure you. Those sorts of conversations were happening a lot. Um, uh, and it was quite tough to get to get insurance for a lot of businesses. Um, we're now seeing a relaxation of that slightly um, as we as we finish 2023 and we're going into 2024, where there's there's less pressure on pricing. There's not so many dramatic price rises as there were in premiums. Um, assuming that you've taken some very basic, practical, um, common sense steps to protect your domain, you can have insurance as an SME from a few hundred pounds a year. You know, those are the sorts of prices that we're seeing uh, out of composite insurance markets. Um, there are some really good new facilities that people uh, like Aviva have just recently released. They've launched a a breach response kind of only service, which doesn't have the insurance necessarily stacked up with high limits, but actually has a the has is giving you a a, a bat phone when 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 you get hit and, and a full access to their breach response panelists to help you recover and respond from that. And you can have that from fifty quid um, a year, you know. So it's it's very affordable. Um, it's very practical. You do still need to take some minimum sensible steps uh, to protect yourself. Um, but but the insurance market has has done its level best to make um, insurance as broadly available as possible, as affordably as possible. Neil, you know, from your experience with some of the customers that that that, that you've dealt with on this, obviously you deal with the, the other side of it. Those customers have had those incidents. You know, are they starting to? Uh, do you deal with the insurance companies as well, or is it independently them? You know, the the people who've been breached coming to you. Is it kind of referred by the insurance companies? How does it work in this particular industry that you're in? By and large, it's the insurers. We are on the insurers' panels, and then the ins and then so they will provide the insurers will provide as part of their policy through the broker. They'll provide the our hotline details, etc. Um, to the to the insured customers, and then when they have an incident, usually actually they usually call their broker. <laughs> um, but if they were to read their policy documents, they have to call us directly. But uh, it doesn't matter, you know. In a in a very short period of time, uh, we get to speak and respond to the incident. Um, so that's essentially how how it kind of works. We've got a separate service where we we for those organisations that either can't get insurance cover or don't want to get insurance cover, or uh, as Matthew was saying before, uh, maybe on the trajectory to attaining insurance cover, but can't get it quite at the moment. We've got uh, a cyber, what's called cyber care, which they can sign up to that. Um, and we'll provide the, the hotline support, pretty much everything they need, you know, the legal advice, the crisis PR, the, the technical sort of, digital forensics and investigations, ransom negotiation and settlement. We've even got a trauma counsellor on our team as well. Um, we're trying to encourage insurers to uh, to add trauma counselling in as a as a as an area of cover. They haven't done it yet, but we are really hoping that they will because we found in so many incidents that the the trauma that can be caused to um, senior management that are in the thick of things when they have an incident or to the IT team. Um, and sometimes also the guilt that's suffered by, you know, the actual poor victim to were scammed or were fished. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like an important aspect as well, but we've really worked hard over the last sort of decade to have like an all in one, all encompassing, uh, service that provides anything that a victim would need to investigate and recover. Okay. And like when it comes to kind of those customers who have experienced it, you know, do they, I take it you see them kind of go through a period afterwards where they really increase their security. They've had that incident. 
they've realized how bad it can get they've they've experienced the horror and it's kind of like well i'm never going through that again do you see a, a good uptick in people who say right what we're going to do is we're going to shore up everything that we've got we're going to start getting some of the more modern things like continuous pen testing or you know update our technological security countermeasures make sure we've got good incident response i mean one of the things i've always said to, to all our customers is always have robust incident response because you are going to have an event at some point you're going to have an event you know you have to test it you have to make sure it works um and it, and indeed if you're required to meet the pci dss standard or the iso 27001 standard one of those the aspects that you see in there is you know you've got to test it you've got to war game it so to speak which is becoming even more um popular these days do you see a massive uptick in awareness not only for the companies that deal with it but maybe the adjacent companies as well either the parent companies the um, other companies who are in their space suddenly come to you and say, uh, can we have some insurance? And by the way, it would be great to, to make sure we got some decent incident response. Yeah, we, we have, just interestingly on that, James, you know, uh, something like a third, I think it's about 28% when I looked at the number, of people that, that ask us for quotes are, are because they've heard of peer group companies suffering an attack. So... You know, it's a fear of that happening to us, which drives them to to approach us. The other thing we're seeing this a lot is counterparty requirements in contracts. So, you know, you touched on a few um, standards there, and, and they, they may well require or, or lead to or just make it very sensible to have insurance. But we are seeing lots of um, counterparties requiring customers, our, our clients, to, to carry us, uh, certain types of insurance, certain levels of cyber insurance as well. So that's that's becoming a thing, but as with any other type of insurance claim, you know, it's a fire or a flood or a theft. We always find that people get wise after the event. So you know, you, you try to get them to a good place and make them as resilient as possible with clever risk management before these things happen. But if there's a loophole and something something does occur and they get hit, they they can learn from that and they can they can do better next time. And and cyber is no different to that. So we're constantly talking to clients about taking those practical steps to protect themselves, to have a good corporate governance um, story to tell about your processes and procedures, building a cyber aware workforce with great training, adopting a privacy first or security first infrastructure, um, having a good story to tell about device patching, uh, updating software, authentication, encrypting data, and having, as you said, a plan for disaster. So those are the sorts of areas where we're spending a lot of time talking to clients about what they should be doing, um, which would reduce their cost, their, their their chance of becoming a victim. And when it does happen, makes it much easier for them to recover and and and, and survive the event for sure. It's a good point, Matthew. I think um, what we found, we looked at our we looked at our claims data for um, after many years of sort of first response, and we wanted to. Um, identify what it was that companies who were suffering incidents were getting wrong, not so much at the operational level. If you think like every business has got like a strategic level and they've got sort of tactical and then they've got operational, executive team, man, uh, middle management, and then uh, specialists, uh, whatever they do. Um, and we wanted to find what it was they were getting wrong at sort of like the board level. Mm. So we found seven seven key strategies um which are completely non-technical things such as you know what's the it budget as a percentage of revenue what's the what we call the it staff count ratio how many how many it support people have you got for the number of end users and that can include third party providers as well and sort of like full-time equivalents that's just an example of two you know response one of them is responsibilities have you got someone on the board they can be a ned but someone who is if you like a cyber champion um uh there are these, these seven key strategies and organizations we're finding that organizations that are challenged in cyber uh even if they've got a cso for instance even if they've got um you know uh people who are responsible and who are who know what they're doing at the operational level they are they can still be very vulnerable because they they as a business they haven't got a strategy for dealing with cyber risk management and 
So at the end of the day, you know, if money runs out in one particular area or whatever, and you, you see, I'm sure you've seen so many of this yourself, James, where businesses are, you know, in a way they are managing cyber risk on a shoestring um, and, you know, on a, on a best efforts basis, basically. And, you know, even medium size and large companies that we've dealt with will, will, will respond to the incident and the senior management team will have never met anyone in the IT department. And that includes the senior management in the IT department, you know? And uh, so, you know, there's a different, there's a te particular techniques of actually managing that situation effectively. But nonetheless, there, I think there is still quite a long way for businesses to go to be taking, to, for boards to appreciate that cyber risk management is not an operational problem. And it's something that they can ultimately control. I mean, you, for instance, you would never get a board saying that health and safety is, you know, an operational problem. You know, they all appreciate that health and safety is a board level problem and they have to strategize for it. And cyber risk is no different. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. I mean, you know, we've been remodeling our defense in depth kind of recommendations to customers for quite a while now, you know, moving towards a more kind of active level of defense rather than a reactive level of defense, which is the more traditional methods of doing it. Obviously, you still need your endpoint security, you still need your firewalls, you still need all the various different things that you needed before, but also adding in a lot more kind of like emphasis on GRC. And we've started putting in recommendations on things like cyber insurance as something that, that should definitely be looked at and definitely considered. And I think one of the big questions I have is we've seen a bit of a trend um, recently, and I don't think it's going to change anywhere. People in the manufacturing industry and in the service provider specific industry are getting hit through their third parties. So they're not the ones that have necessarily had the big hit. They, they, they are definitely the ones that are suffering from it. Um, but it's down to somewhere down in the food chain, a cloud provider, a software provider, a backup provider or something that gets hit, which by proxy causes them to have like their own security incident. It has, you know, does cyber insurance kind of cover people for that as well? Or is that like an additional product on top of a standard cyber in insurance policy? I'd, I'd like to understand that a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. So absolutely, it does. It can, um, and and that's th th that that sort of exposure or threat vector, the way an attack can occur is is super important. It's 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 a very important piece of the underwriting process for brokers like ourselves to ask the relevant questions that tease out the information that shows us that that's a risk, right? And you're right. You know, the the, the vendors that com companies depend upon. The, the technology supply chain that they have is now often, even for smaller businesses, is often quite um, is is quite sophisticated, um, and the realization must be there. And we do talk to clients about this that the attack doesn't have to happen against um, uh, our client for it to be insured for, for losses they suffer to be insured. It can be against one of those third parties that they depend upon, or it can come from a third party vendor who's accessing our client systems. In a, in, a, in a way which isn't as, as secure as we'd like. So, so yes, definitely that's the case. Uh, it's something which um, clients need to be alert to, um, and it's something which insurance is is available for um, that, that can happen. Obviously, th there'll be an underwriting process to that, so insurers will look at the manufacturer, for example, and they'll want to look at their operational technologies, or they might want to look at the vendors that they're using and how they're accessing their systems and and, and how it all fits together. But and, and they might have demands around that in point detection and response or managed detection and response, whatever it is um, that's appropriate for it uh, to, to mitigate the risk. But that is something that, um, that they should be aware of. And the revenue dependencies that flow from those kinds of events um, can be quite severe. So having the right level of insurance in place to deal with that uh, is very important. Yeah, Neil, are, are you seeing a lot more kind of attacks on people's, well, I mean, what's it like for an organisation who has, has experienced this? You know, they have their insurance policy. It's a third party or a third party of a third party or even a third party of a third party of a third party that gets attacked. And one minute, everything's peachy, everything looks cool, and the whole world suddenly drops down. 
um, uh, you know, you're you're the man in the in the chair here that that kind of gets to hear these conversations. Um, what are you seeing, and, and what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, there's definitely there is there are definitely more incidents that are, if you like, supply chain incidents. Um, the Move It uh, attack last year, um, the CTS attack, CTS provide um, sort of hosted services for lots of law firms. They, uh, and I don't know whether you read about that in the news, but, you know, there are a number of law firms that were doing, for instance, property conveyancing and sort of uh, with the with the poor, uh, their poor customers who were, or clients, should I say, who were, trying to, to um, complete on their, their property purchases and were unable to do that. So that sort of had a knock-on effect. Um, and, you know, the Move It one was quite a big one. There's still fallout from the Move It attack with insurers reserving their right to subrogate losses. Uh, this is essentially for where the insurers make good the losses of the, of the insureds as part of their cyber insurance policy. But then the insurers also have the right to what's called subrogate. So they have the right to take up with uh, where, the, where the actual failings were, for instance, with a third party provider and to take legal action to recover their losses from those third party providers. So uh, they've definitely reserved their rights, those various insurers in, in, in both of those two instances. And uh, I'm sure that this will occur a lot more, but it certainly, it certainly brings up the point about procurement and the uh, organizations, you know, insured organizations um, need to really think about what their procurement team is doing when they are procuring uh, various services, various technologies, et cetera. And the procurement team uh, are a very good, if you like, first line of defense. Um, to, they're, they're really the team that needs to be trained up in what cyber risk management is all about and what, what they should rightfully be able to expect from the providers of those services to to their organization so basically though you know one of the questions i should probably be asking as part of the standard questions at the beginning whenever you know somebody's coming to p- provide services to their organizations do you actually have any cyber cyber insurance you know item number one do you have infosec people and do you have cyber insurance it's a common common question we ask and and you know very often uh Clients wrongly align cybersecurity with IT, right? So they they think it's all the same thing. So again, you have to go through the process of educating them that these are actually two different specialties, and um, you can have fantastic IT, and that's wonderful, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's completely secure. Uh, and you need somebody from a cybersecurity standpoint with that kind of specialist knowledge to review things there. I think um, Neil made a great point a moment ago about about subrogation and you know, one of the one of the benefits of insurance i always feel which is probably undersold is that when a business has it it doesn't have to worry about pursuing negligent third parties itself right you might have that dependency on that cloud provider or that third party software system and that could be where the intrusion occurs from you don't then have to wade through your your terms and conditions with them and try try trying to sue them for for, for having a breach uh, cause the breach your insurance policy will pay your loss and then if the insurer so chooses, it can go after that negligent third party. So it takes all the headache away from that. It gives you the, the, the satisfaction and the reassurance of knowing that you don't have to do all of that. You can just rely upon your insurance to indemnify you. Okay. So we're reaching the kind of top end of the uh, top end of our time together. And one of the things that I really wanted to kind of hit from both angles is, okay, so, you know, we've established that, that, that cyber insurance is now becoming a, a need to have rather than a, a nice to have, which is kind of maybe where it was a few, you know, a number of years ago, you know, just looking at the amount of monetary value that uh, cybersecurity ventures have said, you know, that, that, that cybercrime is going to be worth is a pretty good indicator that it's definitely something that you need to look at. Um, for organizations going out there to go and procure that kind of thing is it advisable from uh yourselves as the insurer and as to people who've experienced what it's like to to see these companies go through things that things like iso 27001 good certifications adherence to to good security practice by having a CISO and cyber security professionals as well as kind of information security professionals and having a full program a strategy 
underpinning technological infrastructure, you know, that whole defense in depth piece. Can that kind of reduce down the kind of premiums that they can expect when looking to get cyber insurance? Because I think from from speaking to people a while back, I'll be honest, um, about the subject matter of cyber insurance, they were very concerned that it would be, a, a, you know, quite a high premium for something that they didn't, didn't necessarily get a payout for. And I think that maybe that's one of the blockers or one of the the, the things that you've got to click get over when talking about um, cyber insurance with a lot of these people. Is that something that you guys uh, would recommend? Is that something that, that the insurance companies consider? Um, and, you know, after an event, especially, and this is where obviously we'll go over to Neil, you know, if you have had an event, obviously you're going to see your premiums rise. Can you then bring your premiums back down by adhering to that? So, Who's your, let's start with Matthew first on the, you know, to keep your premiums at what would be considered a reasonable level. What would you advise organizations to do? Yeah, I think, I think again, just uh, mentioning COVID, it's difficult to avoid it in these conversations. You know, immediately after that, when it became obvious that SMEs in particular were at risk um, and very often hadn't taken any basic steps to protect themselves, they were uninsurable. So it, it, it almost didn't matter how much they were willing to pay for insurance if they didn't take those basic steps it would that it wouldn't be available to them and that's sort of still the case you know what what a lot of insurers now do is rely upon their external um domain scans as part of the underwriting process they don't need a lot of information from the client themselves they just get it from using their own tools to scan their scan for vulnerabilities um in addition to which, they'll often ask for a, a, a proposal form to be filled in that may go a bit deeper. But essentially, the insurers can get a lot of information just by just from their own scans these days. Um, and they will often tailor the amount and extent of coverage they're willing to provide around that. So if you go further and you invest in an endpoint detection and response solution, if you're a manufacturer, for example, then that will enable you to have higher limits and lower premiums and better better premium rates, all that kind of stuff. So, so that there definitely is a correlation between uh, an improved, enhanced cybersecurity posture and broader in- insurance terms, better coverage limits, lower insurance premiums. Um, it's it's rarely the case that we see insurance premiums necessarily spike immediately after a claim. Um, what we tend to find is that. Insurers will always have a conversation around, you know, what happened in these specific circumstances. What do we need to do, if anything, to stop it happening again? You know, they won't just launch straight into a higher premium. Um, they'll have that. They'll have that conversation. And to my mind, it is all about having those conversations. So, you know, a lot of insurers like to see a cyber aware workforce. So, if you don't have a cyber awareness training program in place, you need to get one. They're they're, they're uh, freely available, actually, from from the National Cybersecurity Center is a good place to start. Or, of course, there are various vendors that, that for a subscription, will provide you, will set you up, and it's very affordable. Um, uh, having um, authentication, multi-factor authentication, on your email accounts, on your remote access points, uh, it is super important, uh, and uh, it shows the, the stats just show us that that claims drop when you've got those in place. So insurers, of course, love them. Like having an intruder alarm on the front door or a fire alarm to detect smoke, you know, you, it's basic stuff like that, which you need to have. The, the, other, the, the other sort of measures will really depend upon the client, its size, its sector, what it's doing, its level of, of technology, its use of operational technologies, its dependence upon third party suppliers and, supply, and technology suppliers. But those having a broker that works that knows how to ask the relevant questions and get the right solution for you is just super important there. And just a very quick one, just to add on to the end of that question before we move over to Neil. What about kind of specific certification like PCI DSS? There's there's you know, it's a it's a bit of a thing here. It's like is there insurance that will cover you not only for obviously the event and the clear up and so on and so forth, but also potentially the fines that are incurred from that, or do you still not insure against that? No, um, cyber insurance will will pay for um, PCI related uh, fines, um, civil fines and penalties uh, that relate to an event which is in, involving obviously the payment card industry data security standards breaches. So that is something that's generally available, broadly available as standard in most policies. Um, obviously, if you've got a, a corner shop that's dealing with a a few tens of thousands of pro, of of, of uh, 
of card uh, transactions a year, it's going to be a different level of cybersecurity uh, questions and control that the insurer will ask around versus a company that's got four or five million a year. You know, so uh, we need to get into that. But but certainly that coverage is available. And to answer your first point, uh, insurers don't gen- generally dictate that that clients have to have an ISO accreditation or cyber essentials uh, certification. But where but where it's it's prudent and necessary, um, we will ourselves say to the client, you should do this, you know, um, particularly around cyber essentials, which I'm actually a big fan of. Um, and, you know, for smaller businesses, it's a very convenient way and an easy, affordable way of de-risking their, their enterprise against a, quite a large proportion of day-to-day cyber risks. So it's a very, very useful thing to do. Basically, it doesn't hurt to have it. <laughs> doesn't hurt to have it, exactly. <laughs> Cool. And, and Neil, again, you know, from your perspective, I mean, what are you seeing? I mean, that's exactly right. That um, I think, you know, businesses can adopt various practices to, um, if you like, make their adoption of cyber insurance really work for them. Lots of insurers provide value-add risk management services as well, including things such as sort of attack surface scanning, things like that. Um, but I think just like anything else, it, it must be taken into account that you know, whether it's cyber essentials or attack surface scanning or anything that we've been talking about on its own is not enough. You know, it's all about a layered approach. MFA on its own isn't, you know, there is there is no cyber silver bullet, basically. Um, we've had a few incidents now where MFA has been, um, you know, been compromised or rooted around. So, um, you know, it's all about various different layers of an onion that organizations need to implement. And obviously, if you're a medium or a larger organization, it's going to be a lot easier. If you're on a, if you're a sort of like on the smaller micro end of the SME, then it's, it's quite a complex thing to do. So it's kind of like very critical to just look at what those sort of key controls are. And as I said, I think even for smaller businesses, Start at the board level first, get your get your strategies right, and then you can have a high level of confidence that everything else will flow. Um, you know, if you haven't got decent IT budgeting, if you if you if you're running your your infrastructure with uh, you know legacy technology, if you are if you if you don't have the number of IT people in external external or internal to look after your end users. It's just a matter of time until you have an incident and it won't matter what, it doesn't matter, it won't matter how much EDR you've got or MFA or whatever, it won't matter, you will still get it breached. So get the strategy right first, then think about what you need to do, if you like, at a tactical and operational level. But remember always that attackers are trying to break process. They're not trying to break people. They're not trying to break technology. They're trying to break processes. And it's what us human beings don't like. We, we don't like processes, right? Um, and so, you know, it's always the process, which is the, the area, certainly for SMEs, it's always the process, which is the area, which is the, where, they, where they, they are least mature in adopting, you know, effective processes, whether it's for, for cybersecurity or quality control or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, it's the process, which is the hard nut to crack. Um, and that's what's got to be supported, if you like, from the from the board level down. Fantastic, and and I totally agree with you. And I think you know now's the time for us to really kind of reconsider. You know, when we look at our defence in depth, which is basically you know what Neil was going through with kind of like the onion. Sometimes it's an onion, sometimes it's an iceberg. It depends on you know what your preference is. Um, cyber insurance is definitely one of those items within that stack you do need to consider because if all else fails and you're cur- currently running on your instant response to kind of recover from it, you are definitely going to need your cyber insurance people to to help you out to recover. A lot of organisations don't. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of cases in the past where that that has has been a significant problem. So, you know, for all of you out there considering cyber insurance, let's have another look let's reconsider it get in touch with matthew get in touch with neil you know have those conversations get in touch with us you know and we'll refer you over to whoever you need um it, it's definitely something in our space that we definitely need to consider going forward i think you have to remember really that cyber insurers are you know if you take it from a selfish point of view 
they they don't want to have claims any more than you want to have incidents. So they are going to do whatever they can to drive those claims down. And that's going to be something that can help you out a lot to reduce your overall exposure to be, to attack. So everyone's on the same side, basically. One other thing on that, I'm uh, happy to to give any any listener on this call a free um, domain scan uh, from a from the insurance company we use so they can see where, at least from an insurer perspective, where they feel their vulnerabilities are. If anybody wants to reach out to James, you can connect them to me, James, and they can have that as a freebie. Absolutely, and thank you very much, Matthew. Um, right, our time together has come to an end. So thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Neil. It's been absolutely fantastic to revisit this. No doubt we will revisit this again in another six months or a year's time. Changes happen all the time in this industry, and I have, I mean, just the amount of change in the last two to three years has just been mind-boggling from a security sense. I mean, Neil's been in it for 40 years, and he knows what it was like 10 years ago. No one cared. Now everybody cares, and everybody's panicking about it, and that's positive. So um, thank you ever so much for, for, for coming and being with us and kind of going over those topics with us. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for listening or even watching the latest edition of Razorwire. It's always good to get feedback. Please feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to us via LinkedIn or through our website, www.razorthorn.com. If you feel that there's something that we should cover, maybe a little bit more in depth, a new topic or something of interest to you or the community at large, um, we'll even do interviews. If you've got any recommendations or you want us to interview people, we'll reach out to those individuals and see if we can get them on camera um, so we can ask them the important questions about info sec um, so it'd be great to see what your feedback is in addition i do have a book uh recently come out the cyber sentinels handbook a primer for information security professionals now this book is very much geared up towards professionals at all levels of their career um be they starters be they newcomers be they people who've been in it for a little while and maybe looking for a little bit more direction albeit the older ones looking to maybe reground themselves in some of the more uh, important aspects of the trade that maybe they've forgotten over time. I've had lots of good feedback from a lot of different readers of a lot, lots of different levels, so please feel free to get yourselves a copy. Um, we've got the e-copy, we've also got the paperback copy, and if you don't want to spend any money, you can go on Kindle Unlimited uh, and read the book for free there as well. So thank you ever so much again. Look after yourselves and we'll be seeing you again soon.